Brilliant, Rob. Thanks ever so much for that. That's um, the, the one talk that I've been looking forward to all, all, all since we've been planning conference and all, all through, not taking away from any other speakers, but that, that's, that's exceptional. Um, we're going to move swiftly on. Um, we do have a, a bonus speaker for you at this point um, due to uh, a slight um, fluidity in our organisation, I should say. Um, so I just want to introduce Mike Heaton to you, um, who's just going to talk briefly about uh, a project that is just starting, um, run by Fame with Mike on board as, as our consultant. And I'll leave it to Mike to tell you a little bit more about that. Just a quick conflict between um, organisers. Paul. Do I need that? Paul knows he's yeah. coming next. Yes, he does. Thank oh, you. for that, yeah. yeah. I've never been described as a bonus before. <laughs> uh, my talk is mercifully... Um, I've broken that, so never mind. So I'll go any further than that. Um, where's, where's Rob gone? I, I did an evaluation in Plymouth, multi-phase evaluation, in about 1994, when Keith Ray was a city archaeologist, and the first thing we had to do was go out and look for caves. The first thing... I'd never done it before either. We had to get a, a caver in and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, those two papers are uh, talking about um, all sorts of things, but particularly the inherent unpredictability of archaeology. It's, it, it, is, it is inherently unpredictable. That characterises it. Um, in our world, we have to pay for it. Somebody's got to pay for it. We've got to work out how we pay for it. Uh, and this short presentation relates to an uh, initiative from Historic England. FAME and CIFA have been jointly commissioned by Historic England to create and promote two instruments of financial management specific to archaeological projects and archaeological contracts. Uh, an archaeological standard method of measurement and an archaeological cost information service. Some of us have been talking about this for several years inconclusively, but this initiative has come from Historic England on their own behalf and also I understand on behalf of other government departments that pay for archaeological work. I've been commissioned by FAME to assist in this because I published a paper several years ago uh, after studying construction management at the University of the West of England. But I'm aware there are others in the conference today with more experience subsequently than me and we'll be calling on them to get involved. Indeed, their involvement will be critical to project success. Uh, what I'm going to say later, later on will alarm some of you. It's already alarmed Adam outside when I was talking to him earlier on. It's important that members of this institution are aware and familiar with these two instruments. Though they will not be mandatory, it is likely that those engaged in government-funded contracts, such as the stuff at Dishforth, will have to use them in tendering and invoicing for work that your companies undertake as contractors, and those of you who are responsible for administration of those projects as consultants will also have to be familiar with them. Particularly consultants, it will change dramatically what you do as a consultant and what is expected of you. Uh, the training, there will be training provided by CIFA and FAME. The terminology comes from the construction industry and has caused confusion amongst archaeologists in the past. A standard method of measurement is a set of rules and protocols by which so-called measured contracts are priced, for, priced and paid for. A measured contract is one in which the contractor is paid for the work actually done, as opposed to what they thought they had to do. It is routinely used in the site investigation and civil engineering, civil engineering industries, to which archaeology is directly comparable. At its most simplistic, if a contractor is awarded a contract to build a rectangular block of concrete, two metres by two metres by two metres, on one metre deep foundation, but because of ground conditions, it is necessary to increase the depth of foundations to two metres. The contractor would be paid twice as much for the foundation components of the work as they had tendered. The difference between the tender costs and payment received is based on a measurement of the as-built structure and the comparison of the measured quantities with those specified in the contract. The process of measurement and payment is called valuation. There is great scope for confusion in our use of the word evaluation and their use of the word valuation, something we have to be wary of. Most archaeological excavation and evaluation contracts are valued on a lump sum basis at the moment, most, not all of them, in which the contractor guesses how much they'll have to dig up, process and analyse and then cuts their cloth according to their means to arrive at an acceptable publication or whatever the product might be and hopefully a profit. This is very imprecise. It places much of the financial risk on the contractor. 
Historically, can also believe it is reducing scope for the application of science to our work and the generation of public benefit because contractors aren't making enough predictable money, profit, from their contracts. Measured contracts would balance that risk more equitably between contractor and client, provide a more predictable financial return for contractors. I have run several contracts as a consultant on this basis and it works perfectly well. And this is the most alarming thing for many of you. A cost information service is a facility with which clients and their professional advisors and contractors, if they want to, can estimate the approximate cost of a project before commencing on it, before they go and speak to the funders and the banks and all those people. It assists them in deciding whether to proceed and whether received, ten whether received tenders are realistic. Historically, this is done using things like price books that listed a range of prices for types of work such as plastering or foundation excavations, expresses price per area, per volume or per day. With the advent of the internet, slightly before actually, but the internet made it viable, the RICS developed a thing called the Building Cost Information Service, which is an interactive and highly detailed database of real construction project costs, with which users can calculate the likely cost of their project. Archaeological costs are not listed on the BCIS, but they should be. And that's something else we need to deal with. An archaeological cost information service would be an accessible and interactive database of real archaeological costs for real archaeological projects and contracts that clients and others not involved in those jobs could use to estimate the likely cost of their projects. When I and a couple of friends from UWE just presented these topics to CIFA at Leicester, I think in 2016, there was a lot of misunderstanding amongst the audience about the these two instruments and their purpose. So let's be absolutely clear now. One, neither of these two instruments will be mandatory. Though it is anticipated that archaeological contracts on government funded projects such as those commissioned by Historic England, uh, DFT or DEFRA, will use the archaeological standard method of measurement and the cost information will be published on the archaeological cost information service. Two, neither instrument requires a contractor to divulge the basis upon which its costs are based, i.e. its pay scales, its charge rates, or its profit margin. Most of us in this room could provide a cost, for instance, for excavating a cubic metre of urban stratigraphy or for process processing a human skeleton without divulging our pay scales, our charge rates, or our profit margins. We could estimate it. Furthermore, all of us will remain free to price individual contracts exactly as we see fit, irrespective of what we might have entered in a measured bill of quantities for a previous one, or entered on the ACIS, previous contract. If a contractor chooses to raise or lower their prices from one tender to the next, nothing associated with these two instruments will hinder that market freedom. They are no more restrictive than CIFA's recommended pay scales. So what are we going to do? One, we're going to invite expressions of interest in participation in the project from members of CIFA fame and probably a ALGAO if it still exists. We need a small committee of interested and experienced people from across the spectrum of subcontractors, contractors and consultants and hopefully from across Britain and Ireland and anywhere else who wants to get involved. Preferably, we want people with experience of using measured contracts. So anyone who on very, very big, stuff like that, they're the people we have to, we're after. And particularly those who are acting as QSs. Some of the bigger archaeological con contractors have QSs, uh, and we'll be eager to speak to them. They will review, comment on, contribute, and correct drafts of the ASMM and the ACS that I produce. Provisionally, this will be done at collective meetings, probably virtual meetings, but there's no reason why it couldn't be done by email, in much the same way that we could sometimes collaboratively write WSIs. I expect it would take about a year, with meetings every month. Uh, this committee will be called the Drafting Committee or the Drafting Panel. I'm not getting hung up on names. We're also going to invite representatives of the client bodies and the construction industry to sit on a second committee that will review the general progress and direction of the project to make sure that we are producing something acceptable to them. Provisionally, that committee will comprise representatives of Historic England, DEFRA, the Park for Transport, as well as landowners such as the MOD and the National Trust. Also the professions, RICS, RIBA, ICE, and representatives of some of the larger construction companies for whom we often subcontract. Uh, 
the people we saw in the, pre in the first presentation, all those big contractors, Balfour's and people like that, we're going to invite them. They will not get involved in the detail, but they will help set the general direction of travel. Specifically, they will be asked to ensure that what we produce is compatible with industry standards, such as the Civil Engineering Standard Method of Measurement for new rules of measurement from the RICS and the new engineering contract. This committee will be called the Review Committee, or it doesn't matter what it's called. It. And we're working in parallel with Kate Geary, who's going to be in charge of quality assurance. I will produce drafts of the two instruments and guidance notes to go with them. Uh, the ASMM will be a bill of quantities and guidance notes on how to use it. The ACIS will be a database. Most of the content will be non-contentious to anyone in this room. For instance, the first two sections of the bill of quantities will probably deal with preliminaries, such as attendance at project meetings, preparation of H&S statements, etc., and attendances, welfare facilities, fencing, shoring, that sort of stuff, that will be costed and paid for on a day rate or a high rate basis. The fourth section will probably deal with processing artefacts, uh, soil samples, specialist analyses, carbon-14, etc., stuff like that. Uh, these things are not contentious. The, the contentious and difficult issue is the middle one. is how we price the excavation of stratigraphy. Now, we already record stratigraphy in great detail in our recording system, and we should do. So recording it is not a problem. It's the resolution to which we do that that matters. I shan't go into how civil engineering measurement works, but they deal with it relatively simply, and ours can be done relatively simply as well. We'll go through an initiative process, draft, review, draft, review, draft, review, until everyone is satisfied that what we've got is usable. We'll then test it, both instruments, on live archaeological projects. Uh, if they need tweaking again, we'll do it again. Uh, and then eventually we'll come up to two documents that we're, we have, two instruments that we're happy uh, are suitable for purpose. Uh, training will be provided by FAME and CIFA. Uh, and the two instruments were reviewed psychically. All the documents produced by the construction industry, and we're the same, they're reviewed psychically on the basis of experience, practitioners' experience. Are there problems that arise? Do things change? We expect to be starting within a few weeks once the communication strategy is approved by Historic England. Uh, in the meantime, I suggest you start collecting time and motion data on how you go about doing archaeological work. Thank you very much.